Vaccines Minister Nadim Zahawi. Good morning, Minister. Um, did you get an invitation to the wedding yesterday? No, but uh, I want to congratulate the Prime Minister and uh, Carrie Simmons uh, on tying the knot. Uh, and it's a, a great uh, feeling uh, as uh, you come together. And of course, uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing for both of them uh, that they uh, have uh, uh, really sort of made their, 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 their marriage vows to one another. Um, the fact that this came out of the blue, is this a kind of a hint to all couples who are waiting uh, and delaying their marriage, hoping that after June the 21st, they'll be able to invite more than 30 people? Was the Prime Minister's uh, and Carrie Simmons' decision to go yesterday a hint that there's no point? June the 21st is not going to be what we hope it was going to be. No, I wouldn't extrapolate anything from that, uh, uh, Trevor. On the 14th of June, we will set out very clearly uh, the data that we are continuing to gather from of, of step three, which was on the 17th of May, and then we'll share that with the nation, as the Prime Minister has done in each and every step, from step one, two, and three, and then, of course, step four. Uh, we continue to vaccinate at scale. We are almost at 39 million people now with at least one dose and uh, almost 25 million people with two doses. So uh, uh, I think the important thing is to keep going vaccinating at scale, but also uh, share the data uh, uh, on the uh, uh, 14th of June, okay. as well, we have done in the past, to give people the, the, the ability then to, to plan ahead. OK, we'll, we'll um, interrogate just how consistent the government has been with that data, not dates promise in a moment. But um, I just want to put to you, that, ask you this morning about a story that's in the Sunday Times saying that it, intelligence uh, sources have um, suggested that it's feasible, that's their word, that the worldwide pandemic came from a Chinese lab in Wuhan. Um, Makes sense to you? And, and why is it taking so long to get to the point where we just know it's feasible? Well, I think it's really important that the WHO is allowed to conduct its investigation unencumbered into the origins of this pandemic and that we should leave no stone unturned to understand why, not only because of obviously the current uh, pandemic that is, uh, has swept the world, but also uh, for future, uh, 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 future proofing uh, the world's capability to uh, deal with pandemics. And it was also really good to see the Prime Minister uh, announced the sort of global radar, uh, which we are leading the way. We, we account for just under 50 percent of all genome sequencing of this virus and the setting up of a global radar to be able to track uh, uh, virus mutations, uh, virus variants is going to be incredibly important. But the WHO has to be able to conduct its investigation unencumbered. You, you, you have to depend on WHO data and guidance for a lot of the things that you do in your job. Do you feel comfortable depending on an agency that's saying now it's feasible that this came out of a lab in Wuhan, but in January was saying that a leak was extremely unlikely? Uh, does that seem like an agency that you can trust? Well, I think the WHO at every step of the way has tried to share as much data with the world as it is able to verify. This is a very difficult situation, as we've seen around the world, not just um, in the WHO, but, of course, in our own country, with our own um, evidence gathering and, of course, advice, and in other countries, every country, whether it's Singapore or uh, uh, Australia or New Zealand or el elsewhere, we've all had to you know, collect evidence and then act upon it. And I think it's only right that the WHO is allowed to conduct its investigation unencumbered uh, I, to be I, able I, to, for all of us to understand and to deal with this and future pandemics. I, I ask this, Minister, because at the heart of um, this week's discussions have been the question of whether we can trust our authorities. And I, I want to come to the uh, issue of um, what Dominic Cummings has been saying to us this week. Um, he took aim at the civil service, at ministers, indeed at himself. But his gravest accusation was that tens of thousands of people 
who didn't need to die perished because of your government's failures and because you didn't level with the people. He said, I think that the idea that any kind of serious inquiry and lessons learned doesn't start until next year is completely terrible. The families of all tens of thousands of people who died didn't need to die. There is absolutely uh, no excuse for delaying the inquiry because a lot of the reasons for why that happened are still in place now. Uh, what he's really saying is the most damning aspect of his allegation is that the failures uh, of the government, that we can't trust government, and that the failures and mistakes that uh, led us to this situation are still there. How can we trust you? Well, I would say a uh, couple of things on this. One is that we will have a proper statutory inquiry where people will come and give evidence under oath. Uh, so we've heard you know, parts of uh, the story. Of course, every life lost is a grandfather, grandmother, father, uncle, aunt. I lost my uncle to this uh, terrible virus uh, because we couldn't get him vaccinated um, in time, although he was eligible for it. So I know the pain of losing uh, loved ones to this virus. We've also saved many lives. The Public Health England's data, the last recent data, suggests that almost 40,000 people have been spared going into hospital and serious illness because of the vaccination programme. Over 13,000 um, have you know, not lost their life. Uh, are alive today because of the vaccination programme. So I think um, the right thing to do is to wait for that inquiry in spring of 2022. Let me Min tell you Minister why I think it's the right thing to do, Trevor. Just one, one tiny thing. If you listen to Professor Jonathan Van Tam, who's working all hours, yeah. 19 hours a day, seven days a week, and he's, he literally was pleading with the nation to say, please, not now, because we need to carry on. We remain in the middle of a very serious situation with the coronavirus pandemic okay. and of course the rest of the world remains in that situation as well so it has to be the right we, thing to do is hear... to have an inquiry when we can learn the lessons and we will absolutely we, we, do that we, and of we course we will this... we... sorry Trump. we hear this point minister we hear this point however ministers come on programs like this all the time and i've heard matt hancock say this maybe a dozen times we are learning all the time we are learning new things as we are going along, and we know things that we didn't know last year. Now, Cummings had some choice words about ministers and their shortcomings, and he said, in particular about Matt Hancock, that he should have been fired at least 15 times for, at, putting it, let's put it mildly, misleading the public uh, by claiming he had been putting a shield around care homes last year. Uh, Cummings said... We were told categorically in March that people would be tested before they went back to care homes. We only subsequently found out that had not happened. Now, all the government rhetoric was, we've put a shield around care homes and blah, 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 Cummings said. It was complete nonsense. Quite the opposite of putting a shield around them. We sent people back to, uh, to care homes with COVID. Now, the point here is not whether the vaccination... Uh, program has worked, whether you've tried your best, but whether when you speak to the public, you have been clear, you have been direct, you have told us the truth and the whole truth, you have levelled with us. Cummings is saying that the one thing that you can control, which is what you say to the public, you haven't actually done straight. Well, I don't recognise that characterisation because I've been working for the past seven months with Matt Hancock. And I can tell you that every day um, he comes into the office and he focuses on using every resource available to us to be able to save lives, not least with this you know, va vaccine rollout that I've been uh, responsible for reporting into him and into the Prime Minister. I think it's really important to remember and to put a bit of context around this, Trevor. You know, in the eye of the storm, of a pandemic early last year, we only had the capability to conduct about 2,000 tests a day. You know, our diagnostics capability in the UK was almost non-existent. Today, last week, last seven days, we conducted over six million tests. So to say that, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but to say that, you know, for some reason we haven't been levelling with people, I think is wrong and is mistaken 
at this every stage, hindsight. Matt Hancock used every resource available to him to do this the is... best possible job for the people that he needed this... to protect. This is not hindsight. Let's deal with the question I actually asked you. Nobody's contesting whether ministers worked hard, whether you tried to do your best. The question was whether you told us the truth as you knew it. Now, the last summer, a consultant geriatrician at, uh, told the uh, British Medical Journal, Journal this. Before any instruction from NHS England, emergency legislation or government cash injections, acute hospitals around the country were busy implementing escalation plans to prevent hospitals from being swamped. Many of us were in good faith and for understandable reasons in that early pandemic context, sending people to care homes with or without COVID-19 testing. Look, this is a senior consultant in a big London hospital. All he's saying is, that government had a difficult choice to make and you decided the more important thing to do is to protect hospitals, uh, even if that meant some risk to care homes. Why, why can't you just say you had a hard choice to make and you made a brave call? Why can't you just say that? Well, I, I think what I was trying to say to you is exactly um, the situation that, as we found ourselves in l early last year, when we entered this pandemic, we could only conduct about 2,000 tests a day. And you had to make sure that you test the front line as well as those who are being discharged into care homes. And on the 15th of April, when that um, decision was made and shared with the country and with the system that people will be tested, the NHS then operationalized that and we grew testing capacity and that target of 100,000 I think was equally important because actually setting targets in government you, is a good thing as I have, have discovered. That there was and, then we, risk. And, and then we continue to expand it, Trevor. So, so but, I don't but think... Minister, you know, but you we, must the, have known sorry. that there was some risk. Why can't you just say, we knew that, but we had a big decision to make and we decided making sure that the NHS was not overwhelmed was the priority. But, but both were the priorities, Trevor. That's the whole thing. What I'm trying to explain to you is both things were the priority, but, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. You work with the resources you have. You do your best with whatever resource you have available to you at the time, as well as then investing in growing it. So if you start a pandemic with the ability to only conduct 2,000 tests a day, you quite rightly say to yourself, how am I going to get to a place where I can do over six million tests in seven days, which is what we've just delivered this past seven days. That is the whole point, is you grow. We, we began this pandemic only able to manufacture 2% of our PPE. We now manufacture about 70% of our PPE. Diagnostics was similar, 2,000, and now, as I say, the capability okay. to do oh, oh, probably over a million a day of tests. So. I don't, I don't see these things uh, are, uh, as, as being a, a trade-off. You have to do both things, but you really do them with the resources that are available to you at the time. It really wasn't what anybody said at the time. And it sounds a little bit like Boris Johnson cakeism that you want it both ways. But let, let's just deal with some of your own responsibilities right now, Minister. Um, you personally have overseen the great success of this administration. 50 million vaccin vaccination doses, third of the population. You've talked about it earlier in this conversation. We've got a lot of stocks. We've got the machinery. Why aren't you keeping up the pace and giving jabs to children as recommended by the European Medical Agency? Well, because first of all, our own regulator has not yet uh, approved giving vaccines to children. Uh, you have to make sure the vaccines are incredibly safe before you give them to children. We've seen the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine being approved by the uh, US regulator and the Canadian regulator for 12 to 15 year olds. Um, the MHRA, our own independent regulator, uh, and of course the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization will have to look very carefully at this because of course you're not vaccinating children um, you know, some obviously get infected and get long COVID, but on the whole, you're vaccinated to protect their families and their communities and the country. So vaccines, as Chris Whitty has said, have to be incredibly safe uh, before you administer them to children. But we will be ready. The infrastructure we've built 
uh, allows us the, the ability to deploy vaccines for 12 to 15 year olds, as well as, of course, planning for the boost in the autumn and the flu vaccination campaign. Uh, so the infrastructure is there, but of course, the clinicians have to make that final decision. There is um, there are reports today that you want to make uh, potentially vaccination compulsory for NHS staff to make sure that you crack down on the spread of the virus in hospitals. Um, for some people, that makes sense. Uh, is, is that what's going to happen? So we've recently consulted on the um, uh, social care frontline staff uh, in terms of um, duty of care to those who are most vulnerable. We, you and I have been just talking about the residents of care homes who were, by the way, put at the top of the list of the vaccination programme. And that duty of care uh, we've been consulting on in terms of condition of deployment into social care. I think it's only right that we look at the healthcare system as well. We've been to, you and I have been talking about infections um, uh, you know, out of hospital. It's absolutely the right thing. It would be incumbent on any responsible government to have the debate, to, have the, to do the thinking as to how we go about protecting the most vulnerable by making, making sure that those who look after them are vaccinated. There is precedent for this. Obviously, surgeons get vaccinated for hepatitis B. So uh, it's something that we are absolutely thinking about. But it's possible. Let me just ask you one last question, Minister. Thank you for your time. Um, you've had to depend on the what people call the, the Whitehall machine, the civil service, public health England, and so on. One of the issues that emerged out of Cummings's testimony is his pretty dusty opinion of the uh, level of delivery and the capability of uh, the civil service in a crisis. Uh, what, what do you say to Cummings and indeed other people who've been saying this week that with the best will in the world, a lot of clever people in our civil service, it literally is not up to snuff, not modern enough, not capable, and that actually we need to take some urgent action to get that machine into the 21st century. I would respectfully disagree, and i tell you for why, uh, and I've been doing this job now for seven months, and I you know, wished that Dominic Cummings uh, was there because he wasn't involved in the vaccination program, but I wished he was there because he would see the capability of the civil service, whether it be Maddie McTurnan, who's my senior responsible officer on vaccine supply, um, Ruth Todd, who works with her, Steve Glass, or Emily Lawson, the brilliant uh, senior responsible officer at the NHS doing the deployment. He would have seen the civil service at its best coming together with our armed forces, with, of course, the NHS family, doctors, nurses, uh, the GPs, the pharmacists, all coming together with the you, private sector, of course, you, and local government. Local government has been an incredibly integral part of this. He would have seen a machinery of government coming together with extraordinary talent in the civil service delivering this programme. And I, if, if he'd been there, I think he would have maybe possibly had a different point of view in front of the you, commission. You, 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 you said uh, over the last seven months the civil service at its best uh, delivers. Um, but the problem is it's probably not all at, always at its best. Let me quote you what uh, Mr Cummings had to say on all of this. We all should be asking, and you guys in the political parties need to ask yourselves, um, what is it about your parties that give choices like Johnson and Corbyn? And we have to ask, what is it about Whitehall that promotes so many people who are completely out of their depth? Do you have no uh, sympathy with that view? Well, all I can say to you, and we all fall back on the experiences that we have, the experience of being the vaccines deployment minister, I don't recognise that point of view. There are extraordinarily talented people in the civil service doing an incredible job. And I can tell you, because I came out of the private sector into politics, as you know, Trevor, uh, you and I go back a long way, I would hire all of them in a heartbeat. They are amazing people doing amazing work, working all hours and delivering operationally competent people. And as I say, if Dominic Cummings had been uh, you know, involved in the vaccination programme, I suspect he would, may have changed his mind on uh, that view that he gave the committee. Minister, thank you very much for your time this morning.